Welcome to the Online Great Books podcast brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hello, dear listener, and welcome back to the summer edition of Online Great Books Podcast. I'm Brett, the producer. And before we get started with uh, today's episode, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the mystery of part two of World Made by Hand. Ironically, technology failed us, and we simply did not have the files for the second part of the show. We could not find them anywhere. So we decided to just give you some time to read the book for yourself, record your own review, complete with a part two if you want. But I am sorry about that, and I'm sorry we've uh, left you hanging all this time. But today we start a real part one of two. Scott and Carl will be discussing Hilaire du Berger's only book, which went through only one printing. It is called Background to Betrayal, The Tragedy of Vietnam. Now I'm actually going to set the stage for you here by reading the uh, introduction to the book. It's a couple of pages, and it's written by Robert Welch. At the time this book is being published, the heated words of dispute over what is really happening in Vietnam have soared into a conflagration. Everybody from Susan Laban and Senator Dodd to Henry Cabot Lodge and Maxwell Taylor has versions to give you of who is doing what to whom and why and for what purpose. And in some of these versions, anyway, any resemblance to the truth is purely coincidental. This book, however, is not concerned primarily with the present tragedy in Vietnam. Its subtitle is The Tragedy of Vietnam, which indicates a far longer perspective. The carefully staged managed horror now being acted out in that unhappy country is of great interest because of the undisclosed purposes for which this fraud is being perpetrated and prolonged. But this volume is history, not conjecture. It was the destruction and demoralization of anti-communist groups and leaders in South Vietnam already carried out by the end of the Eisenhower administration through the regime it had imposed on the Vietnamese people, to which the current confusion is but an epilogue. And regardless of whatever whole new tragedy this confusion may be intended to serve in turn as a prologue, the author of this book is simply attempting to make clear the background to the total betrayal. It is apparent to anybody who will study all of the antics on this stage with prerequisite knowledge and objective vision that communist influences are pulling the strings and determining actions on both sides, exactly as we now know to have been the case with the Korean War. And it is entirely possible that a repetition of that sham on a far more extensive scale with far more serious aspects and results might be in the making. And from there, I will turn it over to Scott and Carl. This is part one of their discussion on background to betrayal. Thank you for listening. Thanks for your time and attention. Take care. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today on the Online Great Books podcast, we are going to cover a book that has not one name in it that I will be able to pronounce correctly. (laughs) Yes. Apologies to everybody. Uh, It's just not going to happen. It, it, the book uh, is Background to Betrayal, The Tragedy of Vietnam by Hilaire du Berrier. I'm pretty cl- close on that one, um, but it's about Vietnam. So there are a lot of Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam. There you go. Vietnam proper names in here that I am going to chow up real bad. This is a very interesting book. Uh, it was it was in the Americanist Library. Hmm. It went through, as far as I know, one printing in 1965. It's hard to find, mm-hmm. but... You can't uh, find it. It's on archive. archive.org. Archive.org, you can find it. Yeah. A few other caveats. Not only will I mispronounce all of these names, probably won't even attempt to pronounce a lot of them. We've taken in uh, Charity's granddad. That's Haskell, and he's 87, and he's in the next room. And I told him that we're going to do this, but if he decides that he can't hear Marshall Dillon on Gunsmoke well enough, he's going to turn it up, and you guys may get to hear a little Gunsmoke. So uh, uh, that's the well, way it is over here. I have moved my, I have moved my podcast setup into mm. the house. It was in the in the barn. So uh, beloved spouse has taken that office from me mm. in a flanking action. 
uh, she took it. And so I've got a setup here in the house. So I have some kids that are supposed to be homeschooling and they might pop in. Yeah. Uh, so there you go. And I also want to ask, so I want to ask the audience. So this is a new microphone. It is mm. still a Shure microphone, S-H-U-R-E. It's the MV7 and it has some settings. I have it on the dark setting right now. Here is the natural setting and here's the bright setting. So uh, you could, well, you know, if you sign up with us, you can, co- I only want comments on the Slack, I think. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'll make one right now. I'm not even going to put it on the Slack. The bright setting is a no-go, man. No good? No, it's no. All right, back to dark. There you go. This week, background to betrayal. Uh, yeah, so that this is this is a terrible book. Why did you make me read it? Oh it's not terrible. God. It's a good book, but it's it's terrible. I me. have um well, first of all, how are your chickens? Uh well, we have uh fifteen of them. Mm-hmm. They are doing okay. We changed out their uh pine shavings today. Big doings. Gave them fresh stuff. Yeah, so we started with 14. One of them came, unfortunately, was injured either going into the box or during the mailing. Because they can mail chickens, if you didn't know that. And uh, so one of them didn't make it and is uh, uh, entombed somewhere on the property. Hmm. So we went to Tractor Supply and got another one. Got a a little leghorn. Uh, She's cute. So we got, like, multicolored eggs. So we'll know which ones are hers because hers will be white. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's fun. Uh, you know, it was in the in the store yesterday thinking I could get more chickens. Yep. <laughs> and uh trying to collect them trying all. To resist that temptation. Yeah. Yeah, we've got I'm it. new at this. We've never done this before, so uh we're hoping to get eggs. Lots of eggs. Yeah, never have too many. Yeah, I went and picked up 70 uh, broiler chickens this morning at the post office. They I all saw the picture. They all made it. And um, we moved all of our young layers out the other night, and uh, cows are getting fat. So I've got seven cows, three Indian girls, about 30 laying chickens, 70 meat chickens, and an old man here. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> the, the old man is not a food crop, though. No, not yet. We'll see how bad it gets. Yeah, yeah I'm excited. Uh, I know this is not the... Uh... What's that other podcast you do? This is not the Growing Resilience podcast, right. but I'm very excited because my hoe is coming in the mail today. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I'm getting a new hoe. Mm. A new hoe instead of my, my old cheap hoe. A new hoe with interchangeable parts. It's the Never Sync Tools. I think it's called the Mutineer. Yeah, it's a wire hoe. Yeah, I was watching a video. He's that Connor Crickmore. He's he, he's like, you have to have a no weed farm. Well, how do you do that? You know, well, maybe maybe I can do better with this wire hoe because it's rough. You know, you go down the whole line and, and scrape them all up, and then come out the next day, and there's more, and you can lose heart. But as what's his name said, in ten acres enough, you just have to keep at it. Edmund Morris. Yep. Edmund Morris. Yeah. Yeah, you'll get on top of it. Hey, yeah. uh, uh, you want to hear some reviews? Sure. Thunder Greek. Thunder Greek says, "Old boomers yell at clouds." Have awesome. you read that? Have you read? I'm this? not a boomer. No, I'm not a boomer. No, either. I haven't read that one. Only a millennial would think that we might be boomers. He says, when they keep a discussion to the book at hand, they can sometimes be thoughtful and invoke other books they've read. This is rarely the case. Most of the time they diverge the discussion to modern politics and what's wrong with the city slicking kids these days. Their political lean can be described as center right. I'm far right, dude. You're, you couldn't be wronger. <laughs> I am far right. You should see my haircut. Or as they like to say, old school liberal. I'm not an old school liberal. So I imagine if one is a listener of that lean, they would really enjoy their cynical outlook on modern society. I would really like to hear their pitch on how a modern society should function based on their depth of knowledge. However, of them to dismiss any works after 1900 for the progressive outlooks gets rather dull. I understand the importance of Aristotle, but if you can't meaningfully apply his principles to modernity because chattel slavery is gone, then save your breath. They love to describe themselves as non-boobers and poking fun at that generation without introspecting how their perspective pretty well aligns with their targets. This guy is just a lunatic. What? What's his name? 
Thunder Greek. Thunder Greek. Uh, hi, Thunder Greek. We're Come not boomers. On. It's not a boomer outlook. What would the boomer outlook be? Uh, it it wouldn't be me t- caring for my wife's f- grandfather and moving right. cows twice a day. I would have taken the money I got from selling my business, and I would have had a a, a ski bumper sticker on the car that's you know, spending kids inheritance, and we'd have an RV, and we would just be fucking right off into the sunset. Right. Yeah. No. No. This ain't this ain't boomerism. You need to go read your Aristotle's Politics and Ethics too. It's eminently applicable. Aristotle doesn't require shadow slavery for his political system. He says that there are such a thing, there is such a thing as a natural slave, someone who is not a good decision maker, someone who has poor work ethics, someone who doesn't want to do the work, people who are too anxious to make the decisions, people who are not as qualified. And in a society, those people won't govern for whatever reason and must be governed. And those people are natural slaves and they still exist. And it's probably you there in your cube <laughs> doing your well, HR yeah, trainings it, yeah. well, and you clicking could consider the, next. In the, in the recent unpleasantness, uh, there was an effort to force a certain injection on people. Okay. And the people promoting the pushing of the injection would think that those who were anti injection are lacking practical reason. In other words, they're natural slaves and therefore their jobs need to be held hostage and their military service needs to be held hostage and their ability to travel needs to be held hostage to letting the government inject them with something. Yeah. That only makes sense if you agree with Aristotle. Right. Yeah, even, yeah, right. But thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Yeah, but then we've got some really nice ones. Uh, Victor E77 says that this is uh, this is a great podcast, a best kept secret. Says we're doing important work. And uh, uh, Jaquizzle says he's been listening to Scott uh, since he was with the Barbell Logic pod- uh, podcast, officially known as Uncle Scott and Uncle Carl. And he truly feels like they're we're friends. Um, which is odd since he hasn't met us in person, but, uh, yeah, a a lot of really nice, um, really nice, uh, reviews here. Here's one that's interesting. Giving good grades is the name of the user. Don't know about that. It says excellent show. One hour episodes are the way to go. Check out the ones about unrestricted warfare, pride and prejudice. Dean Koontz, all of them. Ooh, I like those three. Yeah. Um, one hour shows are the way to go. Interesting. You know, people say that kind of thing and, and I've always poo pooed that. Cause I think if you don't like a three hour show hit stop after one hour and then come back later when you're ready one week, yeah. week later, perhaps, and listen to one more hour. It's really interesting. Yeah. But here's the best one. Here's the best review, Carl. Ethan from Columbus on April 4th says, simply superb. Scott is this king we all need and don't deserve. I would gladly pledge my life and take up the sword to establish Hambrikistan. If you don't like this podcast, there is something wrong with you, not them. Thank you both very much for what you do. Well, thank you, Ethan. I'm working on my fiefdom, and I may have to pick up the horn and blow the song. Um, And I'll take you up on that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. How will the marching orders be distributed? Uh, oh, uh, I'll, I'll tattoo them on the least among us. And then that person will have to run from man to man and uh, let it, the order be read from his body. Because I don't want somebody to wrap a cigar up in the three cigars up in it, in those orders and lose them on the battlefield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bad opsec. Uh, right. Right. Uh, yeah. So this is a, a bes- besides back to thunder. Thunderpuss. Uh, <laughs> we read lots of books written after 1900. Yeah, and shit on all of them. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not all of them. No, we don't. No, what was that Western book? Dorothy something or other? Oh, wonderful. Yeah, Dorothy, <sighs> Dorothy Johnson's uh, Indian Country. Love that. Highest, highest marks. You must read that. That's just fantastic. Uh, Mishima's 20th Century. Yeah. Uh, Sound of Waves. What a wonderful little book. Wound, uh, Wodehouse. Yep. Um, the Coons book. 
Yeah. Yeah. Monster Hunters. Monster Hunters. Yeah. After Virtue. Yeah. Triumph for the Therapeutic. I mean, we, we've read a lot that we, we praised and we did poop on a lot. Uh, you know, there are some that we, that are, that are pretty great that we hate. And I think that we were even handed with those like, uh, Bernays's propaganda and uh, the Marshall McLuhan book. Oh yeah. Uh, that one, um, the Marcusa. I didn't hate Marshall McLuhan. I, oh, I hate him. It just bothers me. You know, once you, once you read that one, what is it? The medium is the massage. Yeah. Everybody gets the title wrong. Then you walk around, you can't help but see, you read those two books, Propaganda and the Medium is the Massage, and you can't help but walk around and see it everywhere. Everywhere. And, uh, yeah, so probably don't read those. Yeah. Uh, I liked the Sololinsky. We we were talking about that last night in seminar. We did Republic One, and so uh, we were talking about Thrasymachus, this idea that, Justice is the will of the stronger. And I was bringing up Saul Alinsky because the stronger, they make the rules. And Mm -hmm. what does it mean to be stronger? Well, it might mean, unfortunately, being willing to fight dirty. I don't know what opinion you end up having on that, but that's a great book on knowing how to fight dirty and how to win, how to make your ideas be justice. Rather, maybe the, the modern question isn't how to establish justice. It's how to establish my group's ideas as justice. Will to power. Yeah. 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 We're certainly in, a, in an era where, you know, winning doesn't matter. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. That's not true. Convincing the other people, you know, eva- political evangelism is irrelevant at this point. You know, it's only, you know, what can you actually do? What can you enact on your behalf? It's all, all will to power. It's good times. I've been spending a lot of time with the revisionist historians, Carl. Hmm. Would you call Hilaire du Berrier a revisionist historian? I don't know, because what history did I ever get of the Vietnam War? It's very little. All we ever talked about were the, the protests against it. Uh, we never really covered it in my education, so I don't know what the dominant view is. Yeah, I think the dominant view has been whatever pop culture has given us about it. You know, the montage of the, the, the Hueys flying over the rice paddies with the stupid Creedence Clearwater Revival song playing over the background, you know, picture of some, you know, hippie putting a daisy in the, in somebody's M1 barrel, some stupid Neil Young shit. And then, you know, cut to the last Huey leaving, you know, the embassy in Saigon. And then they tell us we lost, but we lost, we lost because of, you know, that's the question. Why did this lose? What? Well, it, why did it start? Why even be there in the first place? Right. Which is what this book is about. This book is published in 1965. So most of it hasn't even happened yet. Yeah. There's a million names in this. I think he probably could have used an editor to clean it up a little bit and make it a little more con- coherent. He goes back and forth in time. He could have done better. A million names, some of which I know. And it's a confederacy of dunces. You read this, you will be very frustrated. You might see parallels to present day. I certainly did. Of State Department and academic people who think they know what they're doing. And what they're doing is experiments with nations. This is not like, so the, the mad scientist does experiments in his lab, but the only things that, that are harmed by it are bacteria in a dish. Well, the political class, they do experiments, and then what did we have? How many thousands of dead, of dead Americans did we have for this? 52,000? I don't know. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Oops. Uh, not counting dead Vietnamese. Do we count dead Vietnamese? McNamara did. Yeah. Uh, is McNamara the one that had the sub-IQ battalion? I think so. Well, McNamara was the Secretary of War. I mean, he was Secretary of War for seven years, and I think it was all under LBJ. Um, he had been president of the Ford Motor Company and was maybe the first quant 
one of the first, Alfred Sloan is probably another one, who managed uh, as an information manager, a person of the information age. He was dealt, you know, he was he was handed this quagmire in, in Vietnam and then had to figure out some way to manage it. Now, if it's Europe in 1944, you can manage it in all kinds of ways. How do you measure your progress? Territory that you have liberated, material that you have destroyed, perhaps. But mostly, you know, have we taken Paris back yet? Have we reached the Rhine? Have we taken Berlin yet? You know, it's it's about territory. Vietnam wasn't about that. So he was he had to find a way to figure out if they were doing things right. There was no front in the way that we're normally we normally think mm-hmm. of since Westphalia or whatever. So, you know, what's he going to do? Body count. That's about all he can do. And people say, well, we lost that war. We didn't. We we killed somewhere between two and three million Vietnamese people. Now, at the cost of around yeah. fifty million, uh, fifty thousand, fifty. I think it's fifty-two thousand. Uh, I don't want to discount, you know, any one of those lives, but the 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 kill to loss ratio is astronomically high. And even if you don't trust McNamara's numbers, pretty efficient, you know, in that way. Mm-hmm. The problem was, well, I think, that 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 the the goals were not proper, but that's not the scope of this book. <laughs> that's a lot of killing. I that's sure a lot of killing. They had a good reason. Gosh, we're never going to get to this book. I've been thinking about this a lot, Carl. You know, this book starts around nineteen thirty eight, something like that. Like you said, he he goes back and forth in time. You know, it's kind of hard to track the chronology here, but it starts prior to World War II uh, when this was French Indochina, and before then it was Cochin China. Vietnam is really no more of a country than Ukraine is, sorry. But by the late 30s, the French are starting to act in a colonial way there, and they have a strong presence there. World War II takes place. At the end of World War II, colonialism is being unwound across the, across the globe. Um, for the worse, in my opinion, the Portuguese are losing their colonies. The Belgians are losing their colonies. The Germans, the Dutch, the English, the French, the Americans, it, of course, didn't lose theirs. Um, and and Marxism was very popular in the third world, very popular in the third world. Contemporary to this book here, there are like fifty thousand Cuban soldiers fighting the ANC in South Africa. Mm-hmm. America was in in danger of this is in my opinion in danger of becoming a republic in a sea of marxism because it was so popular in the third world you know people people wear their che t-shirt and i don't know they they think that's the height of aesthetic and it's cool but that was real south america is still basically marxist except for it said uh, el salvador <laughs> and and, yeah. and maybe parts of Chile, Africa is mostly Marxist. Still, Cuba is. You know, the third world was going Marxist. And, you know, eventually, by the time you get to Kennedy and Lincoln, I think they thought, we need to fight this somewhere. Now, maybe, you know, they talk about, oh, you know, we need to stop the Marxist and we're going to we're going to we're going to stop, you know, red China and Russia here in Vietnam. No, I don't think that was the point. I don't think that was the point. I think it was we need the third world to know that if they flip Marxist, they're going to pay big. It wasn't about Vietnam. Right. We could have done it in like the former Rhodesia, but somewhere I think the the architects of our foreign policy in the mid '60s said the third world needs to know if they flip Marxist, two or three million of them are going to die because the United States doesn't want to be a republic in a sea, an entire globe, completely covered with Stalinism and Marxism. Do you buy that? In the end, I'm not <laughs> sure how much it all matters. I'm not sure there's a material difference, and this will see this would anger all the boomers if I were to say this. Okay, I'm not sure after all of this year, all of these years, all of this bloodshed, that the net sum of personal liberty 
in the so-called free world is higher than the personal liberty in the non-free world. Right. I don't know that it's made any difference. But, you know, a whole lot of dead people, a whole lot of war. Um, I want to read some quotes here. Uh, So this, Robert Welch, in the introduction, this is, what page is this? Oh, I don't know. It's in the introduction. Yeah, it's, uh, it doesn't about even have a page About what the book number. is about, so Robert Welch is saying, it was the destruction and demoralization of anti-communist groups and leaders in South Vietnam already carried out by the end of the Eisenhower administration through the regime it had imposed on the Vietnamese people to which the current confusion is but an epilogue. Okay, so uh, Ho Chi Minh was active in the 40s. In fact, we equipped him, which is interesting. He was our guy. Ho Chi Minh is the communist leader of North Vietnam. You should know, boys and girls. Uncle Ho. Uh, yeah. There were anti-communist groups in country. This is the thesis of the book. Like there's this pirate kingdom. I can't pronounce any of the names. This pirate kingdom that runs all the gambling. And then there's uh, a couple of religious sects that are anti-communist. And uh, of course, there were the French colonialists who were anti-communist. And the United States systematically dismantled all of those and cleared the the stage. That's the claim of the book. And he's got receipts, as we say these days and names, names. And, uh, uh, that's a very frustrating thing. If your premise is communism is bad. Okay. I agree. Then your government's foreign policy, to the extent that you're going to get mixed up in foreign affairs, should be is it going to be to oppose communism okay well then i don't know how picky you can be about who your anti-communists are you know if you just clear everything away it's there's this thing in the bible you you get rid of the devil and you clean out the house and then you come back and seven new ones have moved in you clear out the the uh, the, the local anti-communist forces because you don't like them because they're icky and uh, Ho Chi Minh comes in. Well, they funded him. Yep. L- l- let's, let's. Thanks for bringing us back to the book. This book is <laughs> written. My job. This re- book is written by this Hilaire Duberrier. Who the hell is this guy? He was a French-speaking American who was born in North Dakota a whole long time ago. I don't know his birth date. Uh, I think he was born in the 1800s late 1800s, early 1900s, he ended up being a, a literal born, barnstormer pilot. You know, he's doing these aerobatic shows uh, in a biplane, um, you know, across the Midwest and whatever, and ends up in, uh, ends up in Europe um, doing, a, doing this flying circus stuff. Um, he spoke French, and he ends up in Paris um, – to spend some time with one of his uncles there and just ends up being this globe trotting adventurer. He's a monarchist. One of the first notable things he did, I mean, they're all notable. I mean, what an adventurer, swashbuckling, crazy person. But one of the first, you know, political acts he did, he did was, uh, he, in the thirties, he found his way to Ethiopia to support the King of Ethiopia against Mussolini's Italian forces that were taking Ethiopia he was made a prisoner of the Italians in 1936. This guy's fighting fascism and fighting World War II before anybody's fighting it in 1936. Uh, he gets out of there. He ends up in Spain, of course, because that's where all good monarchists are in the 30s, you know, mm-hmm. fighting communists. Mm-hmm. You know, by and by, being a French speaker, he ends up being a, an advisor and a translator for Bao Dai. I believe I'm pronouncing this properly, which is the the monarch of French Indochina, Cochin China, what we now call Vietnam. So he is one of the one of his one of the uh, privy council to this to this gentleman. So he he is there through the 40s and the 50s, saving documents. He was there in the room during a lot of these conversations. You know, you said he's got the receipts. Like, he literally has the receipts. Just recently, his personal archives were handed over 
to a trust, and uh, there are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of pages, boxes and boxes and boxes of documents relating to this era in Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah. S- somehow this guy is like a freelance diplomatic core person. Very interesting. But this man was there. Uh, this book was printed by the Americanist Library. What well, was under the imprint of the Americanist Library, but it was printed by Western Islands in Belmont, Massachusetts. In all of these are organs of the John Birch Society. The foreword is by Robert Welch, yeah. who was the founder of this John Birch Society. Yeah, so, you know, right wing wing nuts but it doesn't mean that it's wrong it might mean the opposite do people even know what john birch society is now probably not you want to help them no, out? you go ahead uh john birch was supposedly the first uh american killed by the communist he was a missionary i think he was a catholic missionary in china and he was captured and killed by the red chinese robert welch who made his money in can- candy <laughs> started the John Birch Society to fight communism. Everybody has heard about McCarthy and the Red Scare, which come to find out after the fall of the Russia or the United uh, the USSR when we became uh, when we got access to Russian or I'm sorry Soviet era documents, we found that virtually every assertion that he made as to the infiltration of communists in the press, in Hollywood, and et, et cetera, was correct. That's something that you can even look up. I did. I found this out in high school. I did a paper. I did some papers on Soviet Russia. You could dig it up. They said all of this stuff. It was public. It was no secret. Right. You know, it, it, was, it was no secret. The Russians told you what they wanted to do. The Soviets, pardon me. Yeah, and then it's they not did identical it. identical with Russians. Yeah. I kind of liked it. You know, they were honest. Yep, yep. Uh, so the, the John Birch Society was, uh, was and still is uh, dedicated to rooting out the communists in, in the United States. And in 1968-69, William F. Buckley, who became the sort of de facto leader of the right wing of the Republican Party. I was going to say right wing. The Republicans are not right wing of the Republican, you know, I don't know, zeitgeist, whatever, uh, legendarily read out the John Birchers. Uh, I think it was at the 1968 Republican convention and they became by and by marginalized and, uh, treated like, uh, spooks and fools. Mm-hmm. But, you know, time has shown that virtually all of their allegations were correct. Of course, you know, now we know that Buckley was probably, you know, CIA, a CIA spook himself, uh, a weird closeted guy. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff about him that is suspect, but uh, through his influence, the right, the, you know, we, you know, starting in probably 1965, um, the United States came under, you know, basically uniparty rule. And you know, he was Burch's, a harpsichordist. <laughs> of course he was. <laughs> And you know what they say about harpsichordists? Oh, the, I don't. Just, I don't know. Just, There's got to be something, right? They're just a little better than the piccolo player. <laughs> yeah. All right. So in uh, so back to the text. <laughs> okay. So I'm I'm still giving the the sketch here. So in 1954, the French lose their war to retain Indochina. Indochina was what the French called it on May 7th, 1954, at I can't pronounce it. Dien Bien Phu. Is that yep. close enough? Yeah. And so this is Hilaire Duberrier saying, uh, this is on page IX in the book. Yep. It was established that a one hour strike by American planes could have saved the beleaguered garrison and changed the course of history. On five separate occasions, such a strike was discussed, but each time reasons were found to rule out American rescue from the air. Vetoed by John Foster Dulles, the U.S. Secretary of State under Eisenhower. So we could have stopped the fall of the French colonial uh, empire in Indochina, but we didn't. We chose not to. Let's see, page X, page 10. We get the French out. Said Mr. Dulles, a year will be enough for us to train the South Vietnamese government and army to take over and be on their own. That was the plan. So when I'm talking about people doing experiments on nations 
probably the motive is that colonialism is bad. And certainly French colonialism is bad. You know, not necessarily American colonialism, uh, but French colonialism is bad. So we want to get rid of them. And then just an over-optimism that the people that you're dealing with are going to do what you want. You know, uh, nowadays we call this, this is what a neocon is, right? Like Teddy Roosevelt? Or Bill Crystal. You know, this is, we will export democracy. We will install regimes friendly to us as if it's easy. Mm. You know, that we'll just, it's fine. We'll just go in. We got the bright people in government. They know how to do this. And uh, we'll just make it happen. It's very frustrating. There's a, a paragraph later in here, which is very, I'm not going to be able to find it, but it's very telling to me. So let me see it. Let me see if I can find it. Page 92 of my PDF copy. This is good pod, isn't it? I don't have a physical copy of this. So this is on page 78 of the actual book. If the reader's head is swimming as he peruses the descriptions of these ministers of government with their strange names, let him pause for a moment before he puts the whole confusing business out of his mind as not worth the effort. For that is just what the men to whom American conservatives looked for information did for nine long years while South Vietnam rotted. Skip down to the bottom of the paragraph. But the men and publishers to whom thinking Americans looked for sound information would not make the mental effort to familiarize themselves with the area and its leaders so that they could do an intelligent report. So the book's confusing to you. It's a whole bunch of names you don't know in a language you don't know. They all sound the same to me. You know, it's, it's, to me, it's 15 people with the same name. Uh, and I'm trying to keep them, track of them. So my temptation is to get frustrated and say, and just group them together in a category, which I think is the big mistake. You know, we can make the South Vietnamese like we like. No, no, you might be able to make uh, this guy like you like, or these particular people, or maybe some of the Catholics in South Vietnam, you can get to do what you want, but you can't make the whole country do it. You don't even know who's there. You know, I find I don't want to talk about modern things too much. You find similar things going on now. I mean, who of the the Twitter war hawks even knows anything about Russia or Ukraine? They don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, we can do this. Of course we can do this. Well, you don't even know who the players are. It's like trying to play chess and not knowing the difference between a pawn and a queen. Well, that's too much trouble. They all look alike. I read that, I got there, and because I, I was, my, he says, if the reader's head is swimming, mine was. Yep, and me too. And he yelled at me. Yeah, that was a perfectly placed paragraph. I, I, I wrote next to it, self-aware. Like he, he knew how difficult the book was to read. But we read it so you don't have to. <laughs> but you could if you can find a copy for $500 on eBay. Yeah. Dien Bien Phu. There was a French garrison there. I think there were about 14,000 French soldiers there. And they were besieged by Ho Chi Minh's Viet Minh. We ended up, you know, fighting the Viet Minh until 1975. Of that embassy being evacuated. Helicopter on the roof. Yep. First memories of news. You know, it's not like I was there. Yep. And some air support in 1954 would likely have ensured that uh, Ho Chi Minh's forces would have been destroyed. If you look at the casualty numbers and the outcome of that battle, while the 14,000 French that were in garrison there were, de were defeated, they were only barely defeated. And in doing that, they had essentially destroyed Ho Chi Minh's forces in, in toto. The French, given time, could have reinforced. The Americans were there. They could have supported them with their support. And that would have been the end of the, uh, Ho Chi Minh's uh, military forces. But... No, but no, but no, but no, but no. So you're moving on to chapter two, page 13, Du Berrier being a monarchist. He says, the monarchy, had it been strengthened, could have served the country in its civil war and contributed to stability. Now, even if you're not a monarchist, I think that any fair analysis of the civil war in Vietnam would have agreed with that. Because the Vietnam, the, the Vietnam War was a civil war, maybe fomented by us. I don't know. But um, the North and the South were under two different regimes, politically very similar, actually. 
DM's regime in the South is totalitarian and only not communist in name. DM is our guy. DM is the guy that we put in power. Our, our second guy, because we funded Ho Chi Minh originally yeah. too. So, oops, um, oops. No, no matter no whether you're a monarchist or not, I think it's clear that a traditional monarch could have at least contributed some stability and put some of the um, taken some of the heat out of the yeah. damn thing if that monarch had been supported. Now, even if that monarch had been supported in exile by the French or the Americans, the French tried, um, then, then I think that could have been a stabilizing force, especially when you see that early on in the conflict, the players were swamp pirates and strange religious sects in addition to these puppet regimes supported by China or the United States. So those, those other players, the swamp pirates, et cetera, I think could, would have, would have benefited enormously from having their emperor, his reign intact. The way it can work. So here in the United States, the sovereign and the head of state are the same person, which is a problem because when your guy's not in, all of your feelings of patriotism tend to fade. Because if you don't like the guy and he's the public face of your nation, then it's just a whole bunch of ick. If you have a, a an emperor, especially one that's off living in, in France, he's the, he- he's the sovereign and represents Vietnamese-ness if there is such a thing. Then you can have other people fighting it out and maybe you like DM or you hate him, but that doesn't take away your devotion to your country. It separates the two. That's one of the one of the things that uh, democracy loses if you don't have someone who's the guy that represents the place. If that makes any sense, ha- having a monarch unites the nation and the government. Into one thing. Ideally. Americans are not the same thing as the United States of America. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he talks about the, the efforts that had been undertaken by various outside players to undermine Baudai. And then on 14, he says, as, had as much effort been directed to strengthening Baudai as was employed in ruining him and with him the monarchy. A strong Vietnam directed by a premier heading a broad-based popular government might have wielded welded the disparate groups into a solid front against the Reds. Bao Dai could have been replaced by his son, Bao Long. Again, this is my last apology about name pronunciation. We just got to plow forward here. Under a regency headed by Bao Dai's wife, the Empress, giving in, given independence after the war with Ho Chi Minh and guidance not primarily committed to the establishment of a socialist republic, the dynasty might have survived and in time regained its force. It was never given that chance. Yeah. Well, why didn't we? Well, Du Barrier doesn't treat of the motivations, but I believe that this is a continuation of World War I and its sequel. I believe that World War I was basically about destroying the last of the European monarchies. There were some folks that didn't like that, and then we had a sequel, and then we had to turn to the Third World and then uh, clear them all out. Of, of their market uh, monarchies, Thailand retains them. There are a few. There are a few small monarchies out there, but I think that was. I think that was the motivation there among the the American foreign policy wonks. I think. I think it's. I, I, it, it's inscrutable. Their actions are so contradictory and so insane that their knowing their motivations is impossible. And there's not one motivation. There has to be a motive. Uh, I think it's probably. We need to read about French stuff more, I think. Oh, God. I don't want to. French Revolution, oh, no. Napoleon. I think yeah. it's the continuation of the French Revolution. Okay. You know, I'll buy that, it. Uh, Jacobin cleansing. No, that nobility exists is offensive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they need to have their heads chopped off. Yeah. I think, yeah. So in just by existing a guy that's calling himself or the people believe is the emperor of Vietnam, that that can't be allowed to endure. 
how do you account for this being supported then by the French? Because the French, while they were a colonialist power, supported Baudai's monarchy, mostly. Well, if they were... The French had been, they had been there since, I think, 1858. Yeah. Yeah, if, if they had uh, wanted to administer their colonial territories well, they would want it to be stable. Right. You know, rather than... Uh, chopping everything down. So if you actually wanted to, uh, it's like, okay, I don't, I don't know if I have any roosters yet. I hope I got one. I hope I didn't get two because the, the hatchery we bought from 90% are supposed to be hens, pullets. Well, they'll do better if they have a rooster. They'll be happier. Well, what if I, in principle, am opposed to roosterdom? You know, that, that I think that roosters are because, you know, they're, they're bigger and they're beautiful and they're violent. And, uh, but I have a, a theo, I have a near theological r- reason to reject roosters. And then I just kill the rooster. Hmm. How does the flock do? But it doesn't matter. I don't care about that because I have decided that the rooster must go. You know, so if I've decided that there shall be no kings, that there shall be no official nobility, then it doesn't matter what good effect it has, I'm going to get rid of it. I think that might be the motive of American foreign policy in 1950s and 60s. We can't have that. Colonialism is bad in itself. Well, unless, you know... Guam, Puerto Rico, Philippines, you know, American protectorates. That's cool because we call them protectorates. We don't call them colonies. Right. Uh, or even states. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. You can play the game and say, well, gosh, they're being hypocritical. <sighs> but I, I don't think it matters. I don't think they see it that way. Okay. It's a very great temptation I'm trying to figure out the motive for this myself. It is a very great temptation, one of the worst, to consider yourself as being on the forefront of history, on the right side of history. The right side. Yeah. So you get to be the liberator. Mm. I'm not sure when it started, but you get to be the hero of the story. You're the one that uh, is on the side of the poor, distressed peoples of the world. And you can bravely wade in uh, by voting for intervention in Vietnam. You can wade in and help the poor people. And then you become the savior. Okay? It's kind of an inversion of Christianity. You become the savior. Well, you you need more and more people to do that with. Well, okay, so there's Vietnam, and it's, it's groaning under this colonial monarchist Mm. dictatorship (laughs) and I get to go save it. You know, I was born too late. I couldn't, I couldn't fight for the North in the civil war. I couldn't, I wasn't there in Germany to, uh, you know, to, to free the, those oppressed by the Nazis. But here's my chance to be on the right side of history. Hmm. How's that? How'd I do? Pretty good. I mean, it's as good as anything. (laughs) I mean, because, you know, I, I, I've read about this and I've done, a, you know, in this book and I've made a study in other places as well since reading this book. And this is all this shit's inscrutable, man. TLDR, will to power. It is will to power, but it's what are you trying to do with your power? What is it that makes you powerful? Mm-hmm. It's not random violence. It's not setting up a, a, a castle on your property or anything. It's going somewhere else, breaking their stuff in the name of liberation. Right. Yeah, the stories uh, that we tell ourselves are important, I think. Page 15. Back to the text. What of this emperor whom the entire American press tore to shreds in the spring of 1955? Cartoonists sneered at him, and men supposed to be supplying news tore at him with a savagery never applied to Stalin. No one attempted to tell the story of the foreign educated young son of heaven who returned to his country at the age of 18 to reign and learned that his job was to sign papers. 
prepared by petty civil servants whom he despised. I think the modern American would read that and say, well, who the hell does he think he is coming, showing up at 18 thinking he's going to reign? Well, that had been the order there for a thousand years. Mm-hmm. That's who he thought he was. He, he had actually resigned his whole life. Whatever his desires were or could have been didn't matter. He had to take the thought, the job that his great, 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 great grandfather had set in and all of them before him. That was his duty. And, you know, it's hard for us to imagine this because, you know, we were told that we fought, you know, to get rid of George, King George, you know, all the old folks in Vietnam expected him to and wanted him to, but he wasn't able to do it. Uh, he was later, he was later accused of being a Japanese sympathizer. The guy was slandered at every turn in order to undermine his in, undermine his government and his authority. He was accused of being a Japanese, a Japanese sympathizer during World War II, where it seems, though, he was the monarch of a weak country in the, in the, over and over and over again in the face of overwhelming military forces who had to just try to find a way to keep his people intact and to maintain what influence he could as their representative. And over and over again, he's excoriated for this. Ho Chi Minh, that's right at the end of World War II, has you know, come to power. And he actually sent Bao Dai to um, the north to parlay with the Chinese. And this was a chance for Bao Dai to actually escape the country where he knew that he was in danger. He jumped on a plane and went to Nanking. General Marshall there of the Marshall Plan was there to talk to Chiang Kai-shek. According, on the bottom of page 18, and there are copious footnotes here and, as well, and appendixes, appendices. Uh, Marshall was there at that same time to talk to, talk to Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek and to convince him to take Reds into his government. Marshall was actually there to get communists into the Chinese government. He aided and abetted the Mao, Mao's revolution. But, but I thought the United States was anti-communist. Americans are, but the government isn't. This is the world's oldest communist country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's frustrating. You know, you read, you hear this stuff and you think, oh, there goes Hambrick again. This is just, this is internet wingnut stuff. And then, you check it out and you read the sources and it's true. It has not been United States foreign policy to fight communism. It has been United States foreign policy to fight colonialism. Yeah, it's true. Which are different things. Right. So I, I think that people of good faith in the United States government might wish to fight colonialism in order to make sure that the countries of Europe had um, restricted access to, to raw goods, wealth, and so on, in order to keep that level, that playing field level in Europe so that it didn't burst into flames again. I can imagine a quote-unquote right-wing or, you know, Republican or even an America First non-interventionist, you know, taking that stance. You know, we don't want France to have the rubber and the other natural resources from Southeast Asia because we're trying... We're trying to prop at this point. We're trying to prop Germany back up. Like we we burn Germany to the ground, but now we're trying to prop them back up because they're our first defense. If World War Three breaks out, we know that Germany, if a conventional war breaks out between the Soviet Union and the West, Germany is on the anvil. So they're trying to prop Germany up without returning them to military prominence so that we don't have a Fourth Reich. Meanwhile, they've got to make sure that Germany isn't afraid of France because those two don't fucking get along. Can you blame them? No. Yeah, so, I mean, this this is a terrible, terrible thing. And you've got to know that, you know, I'm going to look it up. When did the Soviet Union get atomic power? It didn't happen right away. We had nuclear wep- or atomic weapons for five years, four years before they did. They did in 1949. So there was a wor- worry for a while about a conventional war in Europe. 
in which case Germany's the the new I don't know not Imagino line the Siegfried line it's the Soviet line I can imagine that maybe colonialism would be a threat to a flat non-antagonistic European order that would have to be united against a Soviet threat which is still more of this bullshit because we funded them and gave them General Motors trucks and tanks and Lend Lease and underwrote their World War II victory. So, you know, mm-hmm. we created that monster. Yeah, it seems to be a theme. Yeah, the frustration with this book is the inability, the incoherence of American foreign policy. I mean, the Byzantines did this for a thousand years with reasonable success able to play people off other people but the united states seems not to be able to and it it doesn't seem like they knew what they were doing he's got a summary on page 28 of the book du has a summary uh on june 26th 1954 at the age of 54 dm went home to take over and America's responsibility started. Okay, so we installed him in power. Ten years later, on June 22nd, 1964, black headlines proclaimed the degree of our success from the newsstands of New York. Showdown in Asia, screamed the Journal American, we move up a Marine division, and for nine of those ten years, the Journal American, along with the rest of the news media of America, told its readers we were winning. Okay, so you put the spoiler in so you can understand what's going on in the book. DM and his brother end up dead, probably by suicide, in a bunker in 64, I guess, 63 or 64. 64, I think, yeah. It's a disaster, and we did it. But for all of that time, because he was our man, everybody was being told what a great person he was and how strong he was and what a good government there was in South Vietnam. And, you know, DM is a is a pious Catholic, you know, he wanted to be a priest, so we have the religious angle. Uh, His brother was, in fact, the Archbishop of Saigon. That's interesting. Well, he goes up and sets up a personal family dictatorship. He set up a monarchy. Yeah. He he really did. I mean, he he installs his whole family, his brothers-in-law, his wife, his mother-in-law. Everybody gets extraordinarily powerful sinecures and essentially rule the South, South Vietnam with an iron fist for nine years. It's astounding. DM. Um, now, his brother-in-law's, um, I don't even know. I'm not even going to try it. Uh, not, not his brother-in-law. His brother, New, N-H-U, uh-huh. was 43 when the brother through whom he and his wife were ultimately to rule a nation was made premier. So his brother was made premier. And... Uh, He had studied in France. All of these guys had studied in France. All of them. Baudai, Min, Ho Chi Minh, DM, all of DM's family, Du Barrier says, knew. He had read Machiavelli and later explained his application of Machiavellian principles by describing himself as a Catholic of the left. To his followers, he preached the curative virtues of prisons and political internment camps. In other words, the arms of the leader incapable of inspiring a following. These guys are extraordinarily Machiavellian. I don't think so. I'm going to disagree with you here. I happened to have, well, I was out mowing and I was listening to the prince. Uh And uh, I think they screwed up. Machiavelli says you have to have the people. You have to have the people on your side. And they don't. Well, they screwed up. The sociopath reads Machiavelli and sees the toolbox, but doesn't doesn't see the part in Machiavelli where it says, you know, you, you need to rule f- for the good. Like, you need to have balance. You need to know what to do. You need, you know, th- these are the tools. If you know what to do, these are the tools you can use to do that. Well, they're just like, these are the tools I can use to seize power. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he says uh, on, in 35, knew and his intellectuals of the left remained in the middle from opportunism, not scruples. Of course, you know, this is the problem with the, the political moderate. If you see a moderate, you can't be a moderate from scruples. <laughs> there is no scruple. There is no metric. There is no, to be a moderate, 
is to have other people dictate your position. You know, Carl needs this. Carl says, um, we need, um, you know, post-birth abortions. And then I say, no, no, no. Only the first two days are okay for abortions. Now you as a moderate, you've got to split the difference. And you're like, well, well I'm going to say up to the age of 25, when the frontal the, lobes develop. Yeah. That's what, that's Carl's position. Mine is, well, you know, third, second trimester. So the moderate just has to split the difference. We tell him where he's well, going to be. Age 13. That's the yeah, difference. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So the moderate just has to accept that that's what they're going to do. You know, the moderate is the problem. And if you see a moderate in political discourse, you know, if you're, if your neighbor is a moderate, or you're a moderate, you're probably just, you know, kind of being lazy or you might even be a coward. But if you see somebody that has actual political power that says they're a moderate, you know, that person is not scrupulous, scrupulous. And you should be very wary that they remain in the middle from opportunism as DM and his family did until they received, got the power they wanted. Yeah. Yep. And then you flip the page, and at the top of the page, you get to read about an early American color revolution. It was the policy of American labor to organize native unions in the colonies of our allies and to push the entire to push the native union as a revolutionary political force. When the European power granted independence under American governmental pressure, brought about by the other hand of the same unions, the right of the union leader to head the nation was claimed on the assertion that he had won independence. Considering the double role of American labor in these operations, the claim was justified. In former colonies where a monarchical form of government existed, the next move was invariably against the throne, also in the name of democracy. Thus, the labor leaders supplanted the king. Tunisia is an example of this operation. It was at, a, at an AFL-CIO Congress in San Francisco in September of 51 that Bourguiba, I don't know, was given his mandate and the support of the American press and the State Department to liberate and lead Tunisia. The Moroccan dynasty temporarily escaped the same fate the, um, through the popularity of Muhammad II, but the days of the monarchy were numbered. Yeah, the hate, this is the plot of uh, that. Isn't this the plot of the first James Bond book? The bad guy's a labor leader. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. The hate campaign against the Emperor Bao Dai, which a perusal of old newspapers and magazines discloses, merits study now that the heat of the moment is past. The goal was simple. To create a socialist world, you create socialist nations. Hmm. And these unions were glad to help do that. By the way, now he says, I can't remember where it is in here. I could dig and find it. He says, what exactly were they unionizing? There was no industry in China. It was an entire fiction. It was all smallholders. It was the, they called it the rice bowl of Asia or of the East rice bowl of the East. It's all small, smallholders cultivating their own land. There's nothing to unionize. It's a complete fiction. I have a, a difficulty figuring out what, um, what does the AFL CIO stand for? American Federation of Labor, and I can't remember what CIO is. Those two unions merged and, you know, and consolidated their power. But, like, take the Carpenters Union. You know, I have a friend who's a union carpenter, and I have no objections in principle to union carpentry uh, to teach uh, standards and ensure safety and all of that. Sure. Why does a union care about promoting leftism communism why you know what is the the local carpenters care about what's going on in indochina it's the congress of industrial organizations the cio ah uh, i mean it's it's similar to the medieval guild which is a bunch of people getting together to set prices and standards and training and and to keep out i mean they do want to keep out uh other people but are they going to get involved like undermining the monarchy in Spain? Is that the goal of a guild? I've got a friend, uh, a good friend who's a union electrician. You know, for those guys, it's great. They provide training, standards. You know, you know that if you meet another union journeyman electrician, that he's at least this good. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you're going to be safe working with him. 
uh, union shops are going to be safe. For them, it's great. But then you see in here that there are these other organizations that set up these unions, and then they extract funds from the CIA and from their members to do political action in Tunisia, in South Africa, in Cambodia, in Vietnam. So my poor union electrician friend, you know, his monies are being used to subvert, you know, governments all over the world. You know, if unions did what they were supposed to do, that'd be awesome. I'll tell you what, here in Oklahoma, we need a drywallers union because those guys ain't worth a shit. <laughs> they're, in a, they're in a drywall man in Oklahoma, as far as I can tell, that can even pass as competent. Well, there you go. There's opportunity, AFL-CIO. No, stay the fuck out of here. They'll overthrow, you know, the Rogers County Sheriff. No, 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 no. Well, no, they get behind they me. Over, they have to overthrow, like, Illinois. Oh, okay. Just go to mess with those. They already did. What are you talking about? Re-overthrow it. Oh, okay. If you re-overthrow it, you it gets back to normal. If you overthrow it twice, right? Maybe. I don't know. The, the pendulum swings ever leftward, Carl. I'm sorry. Then it's not a pendulum. It's yeah. a spiral. Yeah. So by 1954, DM is the guy. And we start to see here on chapter five, which is titled, The People Thwarted. Who are the people? Well, it's both. It's the American people and the people of Vietnam. He's talking about her being thwarted. An American group... This is almost too much. I, I'm not going to be able to get this right because all of these connections are too much. You know the meme of Charlie from uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia in front of this board with the pins and all the yarn, like, you know, showing all these connections. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, We would need 20 of those boards to show all of this, all these connections and how this all works. But it's in the book, Background of Betrayal. Go get it. I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here, and hopefully we can kind of see how these organizations crop it up. Lieutenant General Iron Mike O'Daniel, head of the American Military Aid Advisory Group, was an all-out partisan of the now Dens, Diem's family. I don't know how to pronounce it. From the moment of Diem's arrival, he forgot the main purpose of his mission. Strengthening Vietnam against the communist power to the north was the least of O'Daniel's worries. Eventually, he left the army and returned to America as Diem's heavy artillery in the greatest public relations campaign ever launched to sell America a liability. So this American military, this general, left the military and then essentially became a lobbyist and a public relations officer for Diem's government. What did that pay? We'll never know. More will be said later of General O'Daniel and Colonel Edward Lansdale, the political officer who was dispatched to help Diem strangle his opposition. So the United States government dispatched this United States colonel uh, to help DM deal with his opposition. Also, there was pros Professor Wesley Fischel, DM's old friend from Michigan State University, who for seven years turned the press and political science section of an American Hall of Learning into indoctrination organs to sell Vietnam's out outside imposed despot and his policies. On the side, Fischl served as a consultant to the U.S. operations mission, the group supplying money to keep Diem in the saddle. Fischl also worked from the inside as a member of Ambassador J. Lawton Collins' staff. It was the practice of this American team, as Southern discontent mounted, to divert the storm from Diem's head by running a local popularity contest against the French by resurrecting old grudges and directing popular anger against the late colonialist. In Vietnam, it met with limited success. In America, far from the scene, there was no voice to contradict them. An important adjunct, adjunct to this team was the International Rescue Committee, IRC as it was called, of New York, which worked on the American front. This organization, into which no investigative spotlight ever probed, had both the finances and apparently a reason for sending a mission to South Vietnam. Whom did they send? The Austrian socialist leader and naturalized American, Joseph Buttinger. So, this foreign upstart, DM, somehow somehow is able to recruit American military general staff to work for him. He's also able to get 
a land grant university that is funded by the fe- federal government, the state government, and the t- and the uh, students who are going there to try to just get a nursing degree. <laughs> Somehow, somehow he commandeers at least a piece of their resources and uses them uh, as an as an advisory group and a political lobbying group, and then in addition to these things, somehow sets up this international rescue committee. That's good rhetoric, mm-hmm. led by an Austrian socialist organizer who had somehow, prior to 1965, obtained American citizenship to essentially steal money from the American taxpayers and run a a PSYOP operation in the press. Later on, we'll find the names and the receipts for the Madison Avenue public relations firms that DM and his operatives hired to actually pay for articles in Time Magazine, Collier's, the New York Times, and myriad other pop, uh, publications to sing the praises of DM and to whitewash the whole operation. Astounding. Uh, I'm sitting here thinking about the uh, how could you do this? How do you do this? How do you do it successfully? You do it when you have control of... It's not the means of production, but it might as well be... Of everything. The means of dissemination. There were no opposing voices. Well, uh, Buckley had gotten rid of the John Birchers. Not yet. Uh, or was going to get yeah. was going to get rid of the, it. So you have appointed voices that are the right and left are one voice. Uh, anybody who's opposed to this is a wingnut. Uh, there's no internet yet. So, dear listener, again wading into modern stuff, the attempt by governments everywhere to put a lock on the internet is so they can do stuff like this and present you with one story and variations on that story. You'll think that you're getting all sides because you'll get one from the right and one from the left. You say, well, I read National Review and The Nation. (laughs) The Atlantic, yeah. Yeah, good for you. But you've gotten all the sides, right? No, no, you haven't. Uh, because we don't allow the wing nuts. We don't allow anybody who knows anything about the actual things going on. And you'll have these sorts of things happen over and over again. Mm-hmm.